there it is. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Colorado Science panel on conserving Colorado's water. I'm Shannon Mullane, the Sun's water reporter. Thanks for joining tonight. So our goal with this panel today is to talk about at-home water efficiency. We'll go over the biggest water use culprits. We have an hour, so I'll start out with introductions and some questions for the panelists. And then we'll try to end with some audience Q&A. Sometimes that time runs a little short, so we'll also be including audience questions as we go. So let's... ...and local government efficiency planning and implement implementation. He also works on state water supply and demand forecasting and developing water efficiency policies. So thanks, Kevin. We have Jessica Thrasher, who is with the Colorado Water Center at Colorado State University, where she works as the diversity, equity, and engagement programs leader. She has certifications in permaculture design, rainwater harvesting, water efficient landscaping, and more, and she has also in the past developed the Language Justice Initiative and the Bilingual Residential Rain Garden Pilot Program with CSU's Colorado Stormwater Center. So thanks, Jessica. And last but not least, we have Lindsay Rogers, who is a water with Western Resource, Resource Advocates. She works with municipalities on water conservation efforts to help with water security and to help reduce pressure on western rivers and streams. And so that means she will water wise landscaping and integrating water use planning. So thanks panel and thanks to everybody for joining once again. If we're ready, I think we can probably just go ahead and dive into questions. How does that sound? Sounds okay. good. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's start with the big picture. Kevin, you can help us with this one. So we know Coloradans around the state are impacted by water supply issues. We're thinking of the Colorado River Basin, Rio Grande, Arkansas, Republican. Can you tell us a little bit more about the water supply issues in Colorado? What are we headed for? Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Shannon. Um, yeah, it, <laughs> I'm not going to be that rosy, actually. It's not a rosy picture, but... <laughs> Um, you know, we we've been in a drought for a very long time. And I'm, you know, recently we were just uh, declared that we were out of the drought for the first time in a while. Um, but there's always a drought happening. And, and really what we're looking at is aridification across the state, across the southwest. Um, and so, you know, we're trying as an agency, we're the policy and planning agency for the state of Colorado. We work in the Department of Natural Resources. And we're, we're really a convening agency and we're looking at, you know, how we can bring everybody together to solve these, these sticky problems of, of these things. And, you know, the state of Colorado is a headwater state. That means we deliver uh, water to 19 states plus the country of Mexico. And, and as Shannon was saying, with all the rivers uh, she mentioned, there's compacts, you know, agreements with downstream stream users that we have, to, um, we have to supply water to those folks. We worked this out legally a long time ago. Um, and unfortunately, some of those things were done in a wetter period, so um, it was a little more of a rosy picture then. Um, but, you know, we're looking at, you know, you know, more people um, and less water um, or same amount of water, but but more people, um, honestly, as we're talking about the municipal sector. And, you know, what we're looking at is really the climate change is going to be a major driver in this. Um, you know, it's going to affect supply and demand on both sides. And so from the supply issues, you know, it's going to be less water in the rivers to bring over for us to use, but also demand, you know, higher evapotranspiration rates, meaning that there's more basically plant sweat, <laughs> as I like to say it. Um, and it's it's more water that's being used up for plants. Um, and that could be agriculture, it could be landscapes, whatever that is. So, you know, we're looking at that as our agency is kind of trying to grapple with this, these issues, along with all the, the river basins, there's, there's, things called roundtables um, in all the river basins around the state that 
have a lot of folks come together and they try to work on their problems within their smaller river basins. And we're looking at the statewide level and we really use a scenario planning approach, you know, five different scenarios, meaning that instead of saying, hey, we're here and we want to be here, um, it's not a deterministic kind of thing. We're not looking at one point in the future saying we need to get there. We're looking at five different scenario, possible scenarios with varying climate, varying drivers such as economy, water supply, demand, technology, those kind of things. And so we're trying to get a better picture of that um, future state so that we can plan better for it. And then we can adjust our planning as we go through. So um, what we're really looking at, though, is from the municipal sector, if you're living in any, any kind of town or city, you know, we're we're looking at a range of about 250,000 acre feet to 750,000 acre foot gap, meaning that we're going to be short that much water by 2050, right? Um, and those are big numbers. I mean, you know, um, an acre foot is 325,851 gallons. So that's a lot of water, a big gap. Um, agriculture is already seeing a gap. <laughs> so we at municipalities aren't really seeing a gap yet, but we are headed that way. And so hence why we're probably talking about all that tonight is trying to, to try to lessen that gap. Um, and, you know, it looks like, you know, new trans basin diversions, you know, water coming over the continental divide or into other mountain um, between different river basins. Um, it, that Those aren't really on the table anymore. Um, it, it, I don't know if that's going to happen in sometime in the future, but really those are kind of off the table. So what we're really looking at is if there's any new supply coming, it's going to be coming from the agricultural sector. And, so we've got to be very thoughtful and careful about this and work together between all these users um, across the state and try to try to bridge those gaps and try to get to a place where we can, you know, maybe we can bring some more water um, over into the municipal sector from the ag sector. But without doing, you know, without thinking it through, it's going to cause some real damage to communities and in and real lives, real communities out there. And so we've got to be very thoughtful about that. Um, and so Kind of what we're looking at we're looking at a big gap in the future and we're all working towards that to try to close those gaps and you know we we need all you guys who are listening tonight um to to help us with that and so hopefully we'll have what we can and will do in the future that's all i had to talk about that <laughs> well i mean that's quite a lot to take um I know that people have probably heard a little bit about the Colorado River Basin and Lake Mead and Lake Powell. These might be names that are familiar to people. Um, that's a big area of my job and Colorado River water. That's one of that is a trans basin diversion into the front range. So Western Slope is involved mm -hmm. with that front range molecules of that river reach every quarter of the state. So and of course, there are all of the other river basins. Um, to consider too. So there's a lot going on here. Um, and you mentioned agriculture and that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, agriculture, it does use 90% of Colorado's water. And obviously part of this conversation is how can, how can agriculture adjust without, without people's businesses and in, incomes unduly and, and making sure economic sector can survive, right? So we've got agriculture over here, that's 90%. We're talking today about cities and towns and how they use water. That's a way smaller slice, that's 7% of Colorado's overall water use. So you all have years of experience working with municipal and at-home water use. Can you just tell us, um, does at-home efficiency really have an impact? Why is it important? And anybody can jump in. Who wants to who wants to take it first? Maybe I'll go ahead and, and jump in here. And I think um, Kevin did a really good job of, of framing out some of those reasons. And the short answer I'll say is that, yes, it absolutely has a very important impact on our water supply challenges in the state. And I think, you know, we tend to often frame this discussion around municipal use and conservation opportunities in the context of overall system-wide water use or this the greater challenges on the Colorado River Basin. And sometimes we lose sight of the really serious challenges that our own municipal water providers are facing here in Colorado and the really enormous impact that water conservation and reuse and efficiency can make in the context of our own individual communities supply resiliency. So Kevin mentioned this gap, you know, just to put it another way, you know, 
it's about the equivalent of what a million Colorado households currently use in a year. So that's the gap we're expecting in the in the M and I sector by 2050. It's a lot of water. Primarily, it's because we're growing a lot in Colorado, as we know. I think we're anticipated to grow about 1.5 million people by 2050, and that growth is coupled on the supply side with climate change, prolonged drought conditions, aridification, which are straining what we already knew was limited water resources in Colorado. So our new supplies are, they're more expensive, they're a lot harder to come by, and then they often have negative impacts on both the environment and of course, agricultural water users when we need new supplies um, in the M&I sector. So these demand side management strategies, again, like conservation and reuse, they really have become our water providers, you know, cheapest and fastest and most reliable way to stretch our existing supplies and, and really bolster their own resiliency in the face of climate change and drought. And demand side, that's this efficiency conversation that you're having that we're having today. Exactly. Right? Okay. Exactly. Kevin, Jessica, do you want to add in? I would also add that I really like to think about all of us being a part of the solution um, because each of us use water, each of us rely on water, and each of us can be a part of reducing our own use to protect the, the rivers that we know and love. Um, I think about it not only for ourselves, but also for our children and their children. And it's our responsibility. You know, decades ago, we had people who were sitting here, sitting like us, like we are today, saying, okay, how do we plan for the future? And because of the decisions they made, we have our water now, um, but it is our responsibility moving forward to plan for those future generations. And there's a lot of big problems out there, but the way that I think about water is very local. And if you think about how you interact with the rivers that go through your cities, with the reservoirs that you love to recreate on, there's so many uses and water is woven through all of our lives. And this is something that we can all be a part of. Thanks. And I'll quickly add to um, kind of echoing what Lindsay was saying about climate change and, and becoming more resilient and <clears throat> looking at how we've changed our maybe urban landscapes have changed over the last 20 years. Um, I got my start in July of 20 or July of 2002 during the, the 2002 drought. And it was a baptism by fire. And, um, and actually there was a huge fire to a couple of big fires then too. Um, but it was a big wake up call because, you know, those landscapes, those conventional landscapes from, you know, could have been from the 1950s, you know, that was the first drought in 20 years that we had had experienced here in the front range. Um, last one was about 1983. So, you know, everybody was, really out of practice and a lot of new people have moved here. And so what happened was those landscapes were not very resilient. And so we lost a lot of landscapes and a lot of trees during those couple of years. Um, and so they were not up to the task. Those landscapes were not ready for this, that shock. Um, and so that's kind of one of those things is, you know, it, we talk about it being a small portion of the overall picture. Um, but for those folks that are facing those gaps, it's not a small, small, um, amount it's a it's a big issue um in the in the cities and so there's a lot of um there's a big gap there and also the uh the fact that these these landscapes are not as resilient as they could be um in the face of these changing you know more aridification um more intense droughts and climate change so just adding that little bit to it gotcha and with those with losing those landscapes um what does that connect to for some of the other environmental issues we're watching? Does it connect to wildfires? Is it what else does it what does it look like when we're when we're losing these landscapes? Good question. You know, um, it, it has a lot. to. I mean, there was it, they people have tied it to, um, you know, mental health as well. Um, and it could be depending on where you're at, it could be wildfire uh, risk. But a lot of it is, you know, economic or mental health focused as well. You know, you've got a lot of these abandoned landscapes in a place um, and it really does not help the community you know economically you're not as as vibrant as you were um, if you're if you've lost trees or um, or landscape uh, temperature wise you're going to be a lot hotter without landscapes in place um, if you've just got dirt um, and you kind of start this the cycle that kind of has a feedback loop that does not help because when you do try to bring those those landscapes back, you're going to be using a lot more water to bring those back in the first place versus keeping those in place. So, you know, literature is tied to, you know, mental health issues, economic issues, um, as well as climate issues as well. 
So, okay. and I'm sure it, depending on where you're at, could be wildfires as well. I sure. would also okay. add to that flooding. Um, as you lose landscapes and as those um, landscapes get very dry, um, then you have more increased risk of flooding as water is running off of those landscapes. Gotcha. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for breaking that down a little bit more. Um, okay, so we're going to uh, shift. We're getting some audience questions, and I'll come back to those in a moment. But um, before we do that, let's shift a little bit into breaking down at-home water use. And so can you just describe a little bit about the biggest water users, both inside and outside of the home? and maybe suggest one way that Coloradans could try and make a use more efficient. Maybe Jessica, do you wanna start with this one? Yeah, sure. So inside the home, um, the toilet uses the vast majority of the water. After that, it's shower and bath. Um, and so there's a lot of different water efficiency programs that will help you to um, to give you a rebate, a lot of municipalities or water providers will pay you to install more water-wise water fixtures. Um, so I really encourage folks to check out what their water provider offerings are. Um, they also, some water providers have these really cool toilet recycle programs. Um, and so, or people will even come install these fixtures for you. So the Larimer County Conservation Corps or other groups like that will come to your home and install them for you. Outside the home, 50% of our residential water is used on our landscapes in the summer months, of course. So there's a lot of ways, and that's really talking about turf grass um, or Kentucky bluegrass, what our typical lawn looks like or a typical yard. Um, and so I have um, in the Colorado Water Center, I love rain gardens and rain barrels. So using benefiting um, using the storm water or rain water that falls naturally on our home, it's free. Our plants love it, and there's a lot of ways that you can collect it and then use it in your home. So rain barrels, in 2016, rain barrels were legalized for the very first time in Colorado. Um, you can use up to 110 gallons in two rain barrels at your house. And I'm sure all of you have noticed that this year was extra rainy, so my rain barrels have been full continuously. Mm -hmm. um, but not only is that a great practice to then use that rainwater on your veggie garden, on your annual plants, on your native plants, but it's also a reminder of how much rain we get and really connects you to the rainfall in your region. Like, okay, my rain barrel's empty, then let's use less water in other ways to conserve. Um, and also like I have two kids and it's really exciting to be able to hear those rain barrels fill um, every, every time it rains. And so I think there's also that appreciation of the rain and kind of changing our view of the rain. And then rain gardens are shallow depressions um, that are planted with native plants. And these are really beneficial because they're bringing in native pollinators, which is just so needed for our region. Um, and then also the, when the water collects in a basin, then it allows the water to infiltrate. We have clay soils, and so water typically runs quickly, or rain typically runs quickly off of our clay soils. By creating these little basins or depressions in our ground, that water then collects and soaks in, which has benefits for our groundwater, increasing our groundwater. But then we also don't have water running off of our lawns that adds to the stormwater pollution, because it picks up trash and debris and fertilizer and oil and then has to then then it has to be treated so both of those measures decrease or increase water quality and then decrease the amount of water that needs to be treated thanks jessica okay lindsay can you tell us a little bit more you want to add on to that sure yeah um you know overall i think when we're talking about both indoor and outdoor water use and conservation opportunities, you know, the thing that a lot of us go to first, myself included, is like, I'm going to take a shorter shower, I'm going to turn off the faucet when I brush my teeth. And those are all great practices. And it's great to teach our children those practices and learn, you know, this conservation ethos, as, as Jessica mentioned. But I think, you know, from a water saving standpoint, we know that really the most impactful strategies are going to be when we you know, we really out, go out and we install high efficiency or low water tools and technologies and, and landscape materials. So um, on the indoor side, you know, of course, EPA water sense high efficiency, you know, fixtures and appliances are great. And Jessica mentioned toilets. 
there's also some newer technologies that are available to us and, and coming out on, on the market. Um, one of those is um, specifically for, for new homes where we can install gray water reuse technology that will recycle the water from our showers to flush our toilets. Um, it's intended to, you know, they, they anticipate savings of up to 25% of indoor residential water demand from that type of technology. And another technology that's that's great for you know existing homeowners is um, leak detection and, and leak monitoring tools. So these are these are systems that connect directly to your water meter. They don't require you to cut any pipe or anything, and it will alert you in as you know frequent as 15 minute increments when you have a water leak or an unusual water use in your house. So if you're out of town and you had something go haywire with your irrigation system or your toilet's leaking, you know you have that data immediately instead of you know a month later when you get an astronomical water bill. Um, so those are some interesting technologies indoor. You know, Jessica mentioned outdoor water use, it makes up 50% um, roughly of our residential water demand in, in Colorado. And, and a lot of that is going to our lawns, which most of those are Kentucky bluegrass. That's a cool season, high water use landscape material. It's been incredibly common uh, feature of our landscapes in Colorado for a very long time and it's particularly important that we've that we you know have some emphasis around outdoor water demand reduction because um, outdoor water use is almost entirely consumptive so you know unlike on the indoor side the water we apply to our landscapes it either evaporates or it gets used up by the plant um, and it can't be treated and reused somewhere down the line so I think that's you know why why a lot of work in the conservation community has been on these outdoor landscapes. So how can we um, replace some of our lawn that is maybe not serving as much for functional value to us um, with water-wise native plants, trees, shrubs? Um, and then to Jessica's point, how can we then take those new beautiful thriving landscapes and re even further reduce our potable water demand by using things like rain gardens and rain barrels, or again, gray water reuse technology, you know, where we can route the water from our showers or our laundry machines and use that for landscape irrigation on site. Great, thanks. Uh, Kevin, did, did they take everything or do you have more to add? <laughs> they did, they took everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna hit maybe one thing is uh, laundry to landscapes uh, gray water systems. Just kind of uh, flesh that out a little bit because there's there's gray water systems and we're helping fund a pilot project here in Denver that's building putting a system in a construction a new construction home and it's you know it's much easier much cheaper to do it that way. But there's laundry to landscape where you can you know your washing machine can pump water 12 feet in the air and so it's a pump that's in the washing machine so you can pump it out through your your wall and out into your landscape and it's, it's allowable if you've got a local gray water ordinance here in Colorado and there's not too many places that have those but um, Grand Junction just passed one in November of 2022 um, and uh, Denver's had one for a long time and I know um, and we're also helping fund uh, Denver's project where they're gonna be doing a lot of incentives for this coming up and a lot of education so it's the Department of Public Health and Environment Grand Junction's following suit. They've got a grant with us. And we've also got a grant down in La Plata County, um, down around Durango, where they're looking to pass a uh, gray water ordinance as well. So those are all things that are pretty low tech. I mean, you still have to drill a hole through your wall, your house. But besides that, it's it's a pretty low tech kind of thing where you can um, help, um, you know, help, uh, you know, supplement your potable water through, you know, um, wash water that you're using uh, for your clothes washing. Gotcha. We'll come back to some more strategies as well as we go on, but I did want to return to one of the audience questions. When we're talking about this gap in the w amount of water and in, in our water supply for municipal and industrial use that you guys were mentioning earlier, um, one of the audience questions was, uh, how will the gap be broken down by the state to individual water districts and suppliers? Do we think about how that breaks down geographically? You know, um, we do. We we've we've done that a pretty we've so I mentioned our water plan and our technical update where we kind of break that down by river basin. 
And then each river basin has their own basin implementation plan. And so they've broken that down into all those individual basin wide plans. Um, and so we've got, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but you know, basically the, the Metro basin, which is really Denver Metro area and South Platte, those are the biggest, you know, uh, gaps basically right now. I mean, that, that's where most of the people live. Basically it's, it's population driven. Um, and so we do know that, and we, uh, we do that, but it, it really depends on these individual, you know, water rights portfolios of these water providers. And some are better off than others. They, they went out there around earlier, they got more senior water rights. And so they won't be curtailed during a drought as, as soon as somebody who has much younger water rights. And so it's that prior appropriation doctrine that first in time, first in right, that really drives a lot of this as well. But that's kind of the short answer of it. And there's a lot more detail with those things. I don't have those numbers off the top of my head though, unfortunately. All right, okay. thanks. Um, there was an, another audience question that came in. Um, when we're talking about municipal water supply and development and we can talk, well, there's actually another panel coming up with the Colorado Sun in September that I'll plug at the end that'll focus more on this. But do you all know of any municipalities in Colorado that base their building permits on future water availability now? Lindsay, do you want me to go or do you want to go? go Lindsay ahead. and I work in this a lot. So we, <laughs> you go first. I talk last. So, the big, you know, there's been a lot of progress over the last decade or so around what we refer to as the integration of water and land use planning. So that's really, you know, moving from more of a traditional conservation approach where we looked at, you know, retrofit programs and existing homeowners and, and found our savings that way towards this approach where we're really looking at the entire development process from when we create our community's comprehensive plan and envision what we want our community to look like in 10 and 20 and 50 years to you know when we write our zoning codes and landscaping ordinance and determine what we at what actually is allowable to be installed in our communities so kevin might have the figure but that that was a goal of the original colorado water plan in 2015 that 75 percent of coloradans would live in communities that have um, have taken some action to integrate water into their land use planning processes and I think we're somewhere in the ballpark of 60 to 80 percent of communities at that point. And the goal was by 2025. So we're doing really well with the goal, which is great. Um, communities take all types of actions. Right. And some of that happens at the building permit stage, like, for example, you know, like you might not issue a certificate of occupancy for someone to move into their home if they um, hadn't complied with your landscaping standards. But I think a lot of that happens even earlier in the process when these communities outline, you know, their zoning districts and what, what types of new development they're going to allow and, and those types of strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that, all what Lindsay said. And, and really the last 10 years has really been a dramatic shift in talking about land use and water together um, versus in the past it was, and, you know, you couldn't talk about those things together because it was immediately people would jump to, oh, you're going to stop growth. You're going to kill growth. And it's like, no, we're trying to figure out a better way to grow because we, you know, having we have a lot of people moving here, a lot of people being born here. Um, and and so it's it's interesting to try to figure out how do you do this through your zoning and your comprehensive planning? And there's a whole lot more local jurisdictions that have water elements in their comprehensive plans uh, now versus 10 years ago. And have much more um, robust landscape codes and building codes that deal with water. Um, and I know that's one of the goals out of the, the uh, gray water project I mentioned and for Denver is they want to try to get, you know, gray water incorporated in the building code in the, in the next couple of years, you know, and, and have a certain criteria set for that. So those are very important. And, but also ultimately you're looking at water adequacy rules, um, you know, for new developments, right. And saying, making sure that you've got to know, have enough water for these new developments and these new houses. Um, you know, if you've been, if anybody has been reading the, the headlines from around the Southwest, there's a bunch of places in Utah and Nevada, or I mean, in Arizona that, you know, they're like, yep, sorry, we don't have any water for you. We built this, this, this subdivision and there's not enough water to, to go around. So, you know, we're very cognizant of that here in the state. And, and that's a really big 
uh, part of the development process where they had to go through and show that it was the bill was actually called show me the water bill right um it was back in 2009 i think state legislature passed it so really important things in the, in the land use realm that can really help um make sure you have enough water and and also you know create more efficiencies in that new development okay so also add um part of of that too, Shannon, is making sure that there are not rules in place now that prevent people from transitioning their landscapes, you know, when they want to. So um, Lindsay and Kevin both will probably know this off the top of their head, but a new house bill just passed that removes the requirement that some HOAs have that their neighborhoods have a certain amount of turf. So mm -hmm. HOAs are no longer able to require that of residents, which goes a long way in helping people to start enabling them to make these transitions easier. Thanks, Jessica. That actually is a great segue into another question that we got from us um, about Nevada legislation in, that goes toward eliminating non-functional turf. Um, people were wondering if there are any programs in Colorado that does the same thing. And more specifically, you questions, do you support this approach or other restrictions? It sounds like we're kind of getting to that answer uh, in your prior responses too, but let's go for it. Yeah, um, I'll jump in because Lindsay could jump in this too, because Lindsay's been involved with this. We're, we do a lot of work together, as you can tell, but, um, you know, it's, We've, the House Bill uh, 22, um, 1151, right? Yeah, 1151 was the turf bill last year that um, basically put a lot of funding, about $2 million towards taking out turf that exists, pre-existing turf, right? So it comes through our organization and we're administering those funds and we're matching local jurisdictions to um, to whatever programs they've got to, to match their dollar for dollar or square foot for square foot, um, however they're working their program. And, um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the non-functional, non-essential turf, we're still kind of wrestling with that definition at the state level, figuring out what that is. And, and thinking about Colorado as a very local control state when it comes to land use regulations, um, trying to work, you know, figure out how that's going to play out across the state, you know, if, if there's a definition that comes down. But um, definitely supportive of that. We're running that program and we've, we've had a really good um, – um turnout for the for the funds for that and and we'll see how that goes in the future um through my grant program the water plan grant program that i'm running for conservation and land use i've been funding some very large scale turf replacement um as uh, specifically one really good projects down at the arapaho county admin admin building in littleton and they replaced three acres of of basically non-functional turf the only person that walked on that was the person mowing it right Nobody was using it and they were using a lot of water on it. So they replaced it with some really nice native grass seed and it looks wonderful. So yeah, definitely support that for sure. Before we- I can I can jump in. Oh, and oh Lindsay, can you um, also just give a few more ideas of what non-functional turf looks like for people in your response? Just yeah, so of course. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Um, you know, just to speak a little bit more to the the that's what's happening in Nevada, that, that legislation was passed in, in 2021. And um, it basically says that they're going to ban and require the removal of non-functional turf grass in Southern Nevada by the end of 2026. And then they really undertook a pretty large stakeholder engagement process to figure out how they define non-functional turf. And Kevin mentioned that that's sort of a process that's underway in Colorado and that will likely fall primarily in with local providers, given the way that we you know, set regulations in Colorado. Um, but in Nevada, you know, they're defining this as basically anywhere where the, the only person that walks on that turf is the person mowing it. Right. It doesn't serve a functional recreational purpose. So these are areas like medians and park strips and front lawns, not in Nevada actually, but some, some providers will define that as, as front, front yards. Um, you know, turf, commercial, industrial properties, like those types of, that type of turf grass. Um, I'll say that in Nevada, they, Southern Nevada Water Authority has, you know, the longest standing turf replacement program in the country. It's been around for 20 plus years, they've replaced thousands of acres of turf grass over that time. And um, 
you know, we've made a lot of progress in Colorado, but they, they are way ahead of us. And I, I don't think, you know, given local control and given, you know, the progress we need to make around sort of access to landscape professionals that can do these projects and access to sourcing plant material. I don't think, I don't think that's the right approach for Colorado, at least at this juncture, but um, there has been really good progress that's being made locally that Kevin mentioned in sort of expanding turf replacement programs. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that um, just last year, a bunch of uh, big water providers on the Colorado River Basin system, which included some of our providers here in Colorado, so Denver Water, Aurora, and Pueblo, um, they all got together and they signed a Colorado River Basin Water Conservation MOU. And one of the commitments that they made was that um, they're going to reduce their non-functional turf grass by 30%. Um, in the coming years. So, you know, those providers are just the very beginning of figuring out how much turf grass is actually in their communities. How are they going to define non-functional? How are they going to pay for that replacement? But they, that has, that's a really big commitment that they made to, you know, really start this transition in Colorado and throughout the basin. I would also add that something that's really important to keep in mind is that a lot of us, myself included, moved here from other places where potentially have a lot more rain and that Kentucky bluegrass doesn't have to be watered. And so when people come here to Colorado, they expect that that's the same kind of landscape that they will have here. And we just all need to recognize that Colorado is not, Kentucky bluegrass does not thrive in Colorado without a lot of water. And that we need to look for other landscapes that are also beautiful and appropriate to Colorado. And so part of this is kind of changing the way that we think of beauty in our landscapes and, and coming to appreciate what Colorado scaping or low water landscapes have to offer here. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really great. Um, a high level. So maybe if people are thinking about this, one of the first things that they can do, it seems like, is go to their local government and get a little bit more information about what's happening in their actual community. And then they can kind of go from there on a lot of these different facts, it seems like. So talking about our local community, I want to return a little bit to our actual homes, the spaces that we're in or are renting, um, keeping those uses in mind that we I'm thinking watering plants. I'm thinking common mistakes with sprinklers. Like what are some things that, or running the, the water while you're wa hand washing dishes. What are some things that we do in our everyday lives that could be slightly tweaked to be efficient? Kevin, is that I'll a- jump I'll, okay. jump I'll jump in. It's always a game of chicken here, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hog the whole thing, but, you know, I think one one thing is, you know, um, if you've got an automatic irrigation system and you still have turf, get, you know, look and see if your water provider is offering an um, irrigation system audit program, right? You know, so there's a, a group out of Boulder called Resource Central, and they've been doing irrigation audits for uh, some sprinkler systems for years um, around the whole front range, and they're looking to expand a little bit beyond the front range. In the near future, um, they're also doing a lot of turf conversion um, and garden in a box, which they're supplying plants for, like a plant by number thing. But um, really, what you know, to tune up your irrigation system, because you know, a lot of the times is you can change your plant material, but if you don't change your irrigation practices and you don't tune up your system, you don't adapt your system to a new plant material, like you know, more like perennials and shrubs and things like that versus grass, um, you're going to still be using the same amount of water. You know, it's it's the plant material is pretty agnostic to how much water you pour on it. Sometimes you could kill some things, obviously, but it'll take, it'll take what you give it a lot most of the time. And so, you know, if you're not changing your programming on your clock or your, your, your system's really inefficient and how it distributes the water across your landscape, those are things that can all be fixed with an irrigation audit. And um, I know I urge people to do that. And, you know, a lot of places I'm glad they do this. A lot of water providers, if they're providing an incentive for new equipment, they make you go and get an audit because you don't know what's wrong with your system until you get the audit. And then, then it's more fine tuned and say, okay, we know what's wrong. Your clock had two different programs at three in the morning, two different times in the week, the week, and you didn't know anything about it. It was irrigating while you're asleep. And you had no idea, right? That's a, that's a very common occurrence. So I'd say 
you know, one of the things that they can, you know, folks can do is look at their irrigation systems and check the clock first and see if there's not, you know, there's some really weird programming at three in the morning on Tuesday night and Thursday night or something like that and, and check that. Thanks. Jessica, I do you have any leaks? Yes, I would also say leaks are so huge. You know, a lot of times, to Kevin's point about your sprinkler systems, um, they if they're running at 3 o'clock in the morning, you don't know when an end cap is missing and it's mm -hmm. just a geyser at night. And so having that, that checkup or that tune-up is really important. I'd also like to point out, I love free things. These audits <laughs> are free. Um, and so you're, it's not something where you should be concerned about okay, well, if somebody comes out and sees that I've been wasting water, I'm gonna be fine or anything like that. These are that these are programs in place only to help. Um, there's also different types of sprinkler heads where they're more efficient than others. And so having someone come out and tell you like, hey, you could reduce the amount of water you're using substantially if you just make these small changes that don't cost very much money. Um, of course, the things like Lindsay already mentioned, like shorter showers, um, making sure that you're doing kind of those best practices, changing out parts of your turf grass and putting in those low water um, gardens. I, you know, I've been in water for a long time, but you hear the rainstorm as well. Yay, it's raining here. Um, but I've been in water for a long time, but even I was intimidated by ripping out my grass and putting in native plants because I don't have a horticulture background. And so there's a lot of these different programs in place where they will help you. So Kevin mentioned uh, garden in a box and this plant by number. I don't know if you have all done the color by number when you were a kid. It's like that but with plants and they give you all the plants and it's very easy. Um, you know, I've used it. I think Lindsay's also used it, probably Kevin too. Um, and so these, these are just to make it easier for you to make those transitions. I guess I'll add in that same vein, and again, just not to, to overemphasize it, but a lot of the, the tools we're sharing are really on this outdoor demand reduction. And I think, you know, that's because we all see a lot of opportunity in this in this sector still. A lot of, you know, we certainly haven't reached diminishing returns with investing in sort of irrigation efficiency and, mm -hmm. and, and water-wise landscaping. Um, so I was going to add that if you're someone who really likes data, which I think some of us are, right? Like there's just a lot of more new smart home technology and the energy sectors really beat us to that, you know, the nest thermostats and that sort of stuff, but we're catching up in the water sector. So we mentioned, you know, there's the leak detection technology. And then there's also, you know, residential focused smart irrigation controllers. And these are weather-based, so um, they are designed, they, they connect to your Wi-Fi, they're designed to provide real-time weather information and to say, oh, it's uh, raining right now at 3 a.m., I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to um, turn these sprinkler system, the sprinkler system off automatically. Um, and those technologies have shown you know, a lot of really significant savings um, and are a good opportunity for folks to invest in. Don't water your grass in the rain. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And in that same vein, I think some of us probably don't know this because we just get a lot of communication in this day and age from every direction, but most of our communities have summer watering restrictions in place um, every year. So even in a year like this where it's pretty wet year. So, you know, a lot of our communities will say, hey, we don't want you to water between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. because we know it's a lot more efficient to water outside of the heat of the day. Or, hey, we know that your lawn can survive if you water it just three times a week. So please only water on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And those are important sort of guidelines for you to use when also when you're thinking about um, your outdoor irrigation. My internet blipped out for a second there, so I missed part of your response, but I trust I got back right at the right time to ask the next question. Okay. Cool. So I, I think that when we're talking about these water efficiency measures um, at home, one thing that I really want to help people understand is, you know, whether the water is actually and things kept in reservoirs or as just an example for perhaps a future dry year or other purposes like that. So residents can make their water use more efficient, but does that necessarily mean it's conserved? 
And can you guys kind of walk us through that? That's a good question. Um, yeah, that's, you know, we talk about conservation and efficiency kind of interchangeable a lot of times, but, you know, uh, the way I view it is the efficiency is kind of the vehicle that gets you somewhere and, you know, conserving water is the goal, but what happens to that water, like you're asking, right? You know, and, and it really kind of comes down to the, the policy decisions and operations decisions of these local water providers and how they, how they're planning for it. Right. Um, and, you know, like you said, there could be a drought reserve, you know, so you're holding water in a pool of water somewhere in a reservoir or, or multiple reservoirs for when you need it to pull it in a drought, a drought reserve. Um, some folks use well water for that, right? Groundwater um, for that kind of thing. They, they get off of groundwater, they get surface water in so they can use surface water, but they're using groundwater for a drought because it just stays there. It doesn't evaporate and it's a good backup supply. Um, or they could be using it for new growth. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you're conserving a lot of, you know, um, being efficient and conserving water and they're putting it into new growth or they could be using it for, you know, um, environmental flows for a river that's been, that needs some water at certain times a year and they can divert it and they've stored it somewhere and they can use it. So it's, it's a really different, it's an individual kind of water provider policy choice a lot of times, I think. And, but I think it's reflective of maybe even the values of a community of what they find more most important and how they're going to use that. Um, but we know that, you know, I, I don't know what people are, what water providers are doing in that respect across the state. Some are probably doing all the above, you know, what I just mentioned. Some are maybe, you know, putting it in new growth. And, um, but, you know, that's the, that's the kind of key to this whole kind of more integrated look at, at land use and water planning as well is, is we, you know, if we're going to grow, we need to make this new growth be as efficient as possible. And, you know, compact water conscious development is really important for that. Um, but also drought reserve is very important, too. You know, you should be holding water on there because, you know, if you've got water there and you're doing efficient, um, you know, programming and efficient new development and all the stuff, on, you know, on in your city and you're holding water there, you can, you know, you can really honestly, you know, change your your um, your goals for a drought response right you can enter a drought later and leave it earlier um, you can you might not have to enter a drought restrictions because your new development is so much more um, efficient so there's a lot of moving parts to that but yeah that's that's an interesting thing because you know I definitely talk about efficiency more than conservation because I don't know what they're how they're treating that water right I don't know what they're doing with that water most of the time you know um, but those water providers have a have a plan and they're doing it a certain way but it's up to them really how they do that so hopefully that answers the question it's kind of a it's kind of a abstract thought um, a little bit but it's it's kind of how things work in that way the other thing that I like to think about is that it's not my water it's our water and so whenever I conserve the water, then that can be used for environmental flows, like Kevin was saying. So the fish are protected. It can be used on a farm. It can be used for another community. And so by thinking about how what we make our own choices at home impacts not only us, but our neighbors, and then this, the other states who rely on this water, because we're so fortunate to live in a, in a state where the river begins. Isn't that amazing? Um, and so I think it's our responsibility and uh, part of our ethic to protect our water for, um, for others. I would just add, I totally echo all of that sentiment and the fact that, you know, this, the, the answer of where the conserved water goes is going to be really locally specific, depending on the, that will individual water providers policies and also, you know, the way their system is, is set up. But um, just an example that I think is pretty compelling and, and, you know, for folks that live on the West Slope and that are typically a little bit closer to their water supply, this may be more typical. It's it's a bit more of a straightforward uh, equation. So just to use Aspen as an example, the city of Aspen, you know, they draw their water supplies from Castle Creek and Maroon Creek, which are right next to the city. They've got very, very limited storage capacity for a variety of, of reasons. And so when their customers reduce their water demand, that conserved water doesn't get stored in a reservoir. It just remains in those creeks and it goes downstream. Um, and, you know, in Aspen's case, they are heavily dependent from year to year on changes in snowpack and snowmelt runoff. 
So that's not maybe the norm. I think what Kevin described is more is more common, right? Where we're especially on the, in the front range, right? We have much more complex water systems. We have storage capacity, so it's a little more challenging to see where that conserved water goes. Um, but typically, you know, it's either going to be saved in that rainy day fund for the next drought. Um, maybe it's going to be stored in the aquifer for that next drought, or um, or it will be used to foster what is hopefully much much more efficient new growth for for the population growth we're experiencing in the state. Okay. All right. Anything else to add there? It seems like that's one of those cases where, again, if you're thinking about, gosh, this seems like a complex thing, maybe the first thing you can do is Google to find out what a provider is and then go look at their website to see what's on there and then plans and a lot of things laid out a lot of the time. So that's a good way to get started and learn more about this and how it works in your community. Um, we are nearing to the end of our panel tonight, and I have a few audience questions, so let's run through those. Um, one question is, is it better to just set my dishes in the dishwasher without rinsing and run it from there? Do you all have an idea of that one? I don't, but these are the questions that keep me up at night, I'll say. Yeah, like, yeah. Can I rinse before I recycle? Like, will it be okay if I just put it in the bin? <laughs> I think it depends on your dishwasher. You know? <laughs> Some are better than others. So I think, and they'll, you know, honestly, you'll, you, you, the new dishwashers are really efficient. I mean, they're, they use a couple gallons for a load. I mean, and they're pretty good about getting that stuff off. He's got to be better at cleaning out your filter. I think if you're not, you get a, how about scrape it off in your compost, then put it in your dishwasher and then wash it. So. <laughs> Jessica, do you want to add on? <laughs> did, did they cover it? I was going to say, just try it first. You know, if you're like, I don't know if my dishwasher is going to be able to handle it, just try it. And if you have to clean it again, then maybe do a little bit of cleaning. Um, <laughs> yeah. So dishwashers okay. are great. I use mine quite frequently. And I have in past reporting um, looked at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency how we use water website. That's a national resource, so it's not local to Colorado, but it does include tips kinds of questions that people might be interested in looking over yeah. and other audience question um oh, okay uh after replacing our lawn with a zero escaping design what effect will the rock have on creating additional heat or if, yeah what do you guys think it's a really, it's a really good question. I think all Kevin and Jessica and I could all speak to this and I'll say it's, you know, it's one of those challenging questions that's coming up a lot recently as we see more of this transition happening. Um, I think we know a few things. The first is that when we talk about adding mulch and um, material to our landscape, that can be either organic, which is things like wood chips or inorganic, which is things like rocks. Rocks can serve certainly a purpose from a design aesthetic and in a rain garden, but oftentimes the, the wood chips are going to be uh, less, you know, they're going to add less heat to the environment. So it's something to consider. Um, and then there's also been, there's been some universities doing research on this topic, which I don't believe we've seen yet in Colorado, but maybe Jessica, that's a CSU initiative. But what they basically found is that you if you can find some happy medium between a, a cool season turf grass and, you know, just gravel and cacti, which is really not what we want to see in our, in our communities in Colorado. If you can find this happy sort of what they refer to in the report as oasis landscaping that has a lot of living plant materials that's still prioritizing our tree canopy and planting new trees, even though they, they take, you know, they use significant water. They're incredibly important for so many other reasons, including, lowering our urban heat island effect so there is a way to do these water wise landscapes you know it's responsibly in a way that will not add to the urban heat island effect i'd also say um just like xeric has a tendency people usually think about rock um which isn't all what it is i mean it's just irrigated like, like a drip irrigation with low water plants 
Um, and also you can have grass. We're not saying you can't have grass, but there's native grass that uses so much less water. So it's not like all grasses are bad. There's even low growing grasses that are um, perfect for our climate. And so it doesn't have to be all rock and no, no, no different types of grass either. Um, and you can also plant all of your plants so close together that they have, it's called natural mulch. And it's really mm -hmm. just those plants um, shading the ground to prevent yeah. weeds. So there's a whole lot of different ways that you can plant your yards um, that incorporate a lot of these different um, types of vegetation. Great, thank you. Um, another question, this is kind of a really 101. And so it's uh, how do different water utilities in Colorado determine how much must be put in the Colorado River system for downriver use? I can repeat it if you want, but my guess is it's something to do with uh, different water utilities in Colorado determine how much each utility must put into the Colorado River system. Yes. Someone has to take on water law here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll take I mean, it. I think I can take a stab at it, but then you guys will correct me. So, you know, and big caveat that I'm not a water attorney, but I think what the question is really asking how much water is how much water that our water providers, water rights actually allow them to divert. So, you know, Kevin mentioned this a bit earlier, but Colorado water law establishes um, an order of priority for which water rights can be diverted from our rivers, and that's called the prior appropriation system. Um, and our water utilities tend to have a portfolio of different water rights. So we've talked about how these systems are pretty complex. And the state engineer's office is the one that lets them know when they can and can't divert their water to ensure that those downriver users um, that maybe uh, you know have are in priority or have senior water rights to them according to water law get their full allocation. Um, and I think what the question might also be asking is you know this this difference between types of water rights in Colorado. So some of our water rights are reusable and some of them aren't. So for example, the, the water that we get through trans basin diversions, that's reusable. And it means the utility can reuse that water to extinction um, and they never need it to put it back in the river if they don't want to. Um, they can treat it, reuse it for landscape irrigation, for example. And then other water rights aren't reusable. So that wastewater gets treated and returned to the river and it gets used by other downstream users. And that's a, a requirement of that right. I think that's a great answer. There's a lot more to this. We could spend a whole, a long, whole long time on that. But instead, let's uh, just, I want to ask for your concluding points. Is there anything in this conversation that we didn't touch on today? Like a challenge you want to highlight, a Colorado program you want to highlight? Um, or you did talk about that you just want to reemphasize as we conclude our panel today. Give yourself a second to think. I would just like to conclude, you know, on the up note of that we can all be a part of the solution. I think you can come away from our meeting tonight and just say, okay, I know that I can reach out to my municipality. I can see what programs I, apply, I qualify for. I can talk to my friends and neighbors about how we can all work together. There's neighborhood solutions. There's neighborhood grants you can even apply for if maybe your entire neighborhood wants to install rain barrels, have a rain barrel party you know, use some of those funds um, to be able to put in these sustainable landscapes. And also when you work together at the neighborhood scale, um, everybody can come over and help you do your installation and then go to the next house, help each other do that installation. And so it lightens the load for everyone. Thank you. I'll go, I'll go jump in next. Um, one thing that we, we really didn't talk about today was uh, water reuse on the, you know, on the uh, centralized kind of scale of a, of a place. And as um, you know, Lindsay was mentioning water rights that can be reused to extinction. And it's really mainly on, on the East slope because we're bringing water over the divide and you can't get it back over there. But there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of really cool policy and law laws passed in the last number of years for um, different uses of reuse, right? So gray water is one of those. 
Um, and but also, you know, water reuse, uh, reusing water for agricultural use. That's that's OK. Now we can use reuse water for crops, but also direct potable reuse, which was um, the law uh, rules been passed as well. And that basically takes wastewater straight back into the um, into a, a treatment plant and it cleans it up for drinking water, it goes back in the system. So we've got different systems of reuse right now, but this is a really more streamlined um, one less your distribution system you have to worry worry about but also opens up a lot of possibilities for um you know making on a large scale being more efficient with the water supplies you have so um that's something that is really fascinating and a lot of stuff work's been done on that it's kind of just there and it's happening but it's really uh, good and i think you know the reuse for agriculture and crops is a really big step towards opening up a lot more um you know water you know for for urban agriculture especially so um, those are just some things that, you know, um, I was just thinking about as, as Lindsay was saying about reuse and and also too like, you know, um, you know, a saying that I heard the other day was, you know, you, you look a city's aspirations are not found in, in its vision, but it's found, it's found in its budget. So look at your local you know, water providers budget, look at your local government's budget and see what they're spending money on. And if they're really serious about doing water efficiency at a, at a large scale, I think that's that's always the recommendation I make and, and advocate for this stuff. It's 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 good. It'll help us um, uh, kind of kind of fight against this climate change, these climate change impacts we're going to see. I would just echo that same sentiment. You know, we talked a lot tonight about what you can do at the individual level at the household scale, but you know, the vast majority of spending that happens on our water infrastructure and these conservation programs and the decisions that are being made, those are happening in your local community or with your local water provider. And I think as community members, we sometimes forget that we like have a very important voice and a role to play in local decision making. Maybe that means you want to run for city council, big commitment. I'm not saying you need to do that, but maybe that just means you're going to be the kind of person that like shows up to the open house for your comprehensive plan or goes and speaks in support or against, you know, a new ordinance or a zoning code or something that, you know, will impact the way your community grows and how water's used in the future. Um, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here because you all are the type of folks that show up at seven o'clock to learn more about water in Colorado, which is amazing. But I think, you know, that that sort of local, you know, engagement um, with our communities is really critical. Yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you to everyone to share a few resources. Um, that we will share with attendees and we can, I think, maybe have a slide for that. Well, wow. those resources are being posted though. If you do like these kinds of Colorado Sun events, you can sign up to receive e um, on our website at coloradosun.com slash events. And we touched on water supply and uh, development. If you're interested in that, there's gonna be a topic um, or another panel at Colorado Suns Sunfest 2023. It's a one day event, September 20, 29th at the Area Higher Education Center. You can get tickets on our website too. Want to give a big thank you to the panelists for joining after work hours tonight and a big thank you for all joining as well. And we hope that you continue to stay keep learning more about at-home water use in this whole efficiency and conservation conversation. Thanks. Thank you.